والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Certainly all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, sustainer and controller of the universe and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger his family, his companions and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In our session on Monday, we talked about uh, the definition of fasting. And all of this, the objective of it is for us to hopefully be able to realize the, the blessings and the virtues has blessed the month of Ramadan with. In talking about the definition of fasting, we talked about the fact that fasting is made up of two components. The component of that, that, that which is physical in store in terms of abstaining from eating and drinking and intimate relations with your spouse. And we also talked about the spiritual component which is also avoiding consciously and deliberately avoiding all sinful actions and behaviors what i would like to do today inshallah is to talk a little bit about the objective of fasting why because again understanding why helps a person to achieve a greater level of sincerity. When you understand why, and hopefully you agree with why, it becomes easy for you to do it, plus you do so willingly with happiness and with gladness in your heart. And that's what sincerity boils down to, brothers and sisters. It is knowing what you're supposed to do, how and where and so on you're supposed to do it, and also, understanding why you're doing it and then eventually eventually all of this will lead you to be happy to do it sincerity is about being happy in doing something wanting to do it that is what sincerity comes down to now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran why he made fasting compulsory he said perhaps that you may develop taqwa you may develop a higher level of consciousness of Allah. Now, what exactly is taqwa? It, it is translated in many translations as fear of Allah. But that translation, although it is not incorrect per se, it still does not really adequately convey the concept or the meaning of taqwa. So, let me share with you a definition that was given by Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu. And this is an amazing definition because it highlights for us that consciousness of Allah is not simply an abstract idea or concept. It is not just a theoretical idea. It is also grounded in, in physical actions and deeds. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah in his tafsir mentions this hadith or narration from a conversation that happened between Umar ibn al-Khattab when he was the Khalifa and Ubay ibn Ka'ab. We know that Umar ibn al-Khattab was the second Khalifa after uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And we know Ubay ibn Ka'ab was one of the well-known reciters and one of the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba about the Qur'an. So one day Umar ibn Khattab said to uh, uh, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, what is taqwa? And Ubay said to him, have you ever walked on a path, a roadway, a pathway, that, that was full of thorns, that is plants that have thorns, these long, needle sharp protrusions that are used by some plants to protect themselves 
thorns. And Omar said to him, yes, I have. I have walked in such a path. Ubay said to him, what did you do when you walked in this path? What did you do? Did you walk as if you had no worry in the world? Right, with your head up in the air, not paying attention to your surroundings. What did you do? He said to Ubay, Shammartu thumma jtahadtu. Shammartu meaning, I gathered my clothing around me. Because if you walk on a path that is full of thorns and you're not careful, your clothing can become snagged in the thorns. In mindfulness of your surroundings, of where you are. And that mindfulness or that consciousness of your surroundings led to two other things. One, he gathered his clothing around him. And two, he carefully selected where he would place his foot for every step. Ubay, Ubay radiallahu anhu said to him, taqwa. That is taqwa. That consciousness you had of your surroundings and the actions you had to take in order to protect your clothing and yourself, he said, that is taqwa. And so, brothers and sisters, from this we can clearly see that taqwa is not just an abstract idea. You know, when we say consciousness of Allah, people might simply think, okay, so I'm aware of Allah. But this awareness of Allah, as you can see, must affect your actions. Or else it is not taqwa. So taqwa is not just the awareness. It is also the subsequent eventuality of your deeds or your actions or your behaviors being affected by the consciousness that you have. Because Omar just wasn't aware of his surroundings. He was not just aware that he was walking on a path of thorns, full of thorn plants. He also took actions, namely to collect his clothing around him and to carefully select and look where he was placing his feet as he walked along this path. So at the end of it, he was safe. His clothing was safe and he was not hurt. So taqwa basically comes down to a mindset that a Muslim has to have. And you see, brothers and sisters, Allah says, this is why he made fasting compulsory, so that we can develop this mindset. This mindset that would guide our actions and our behavior and our attitude after that. It will point us in the right direction. So fasting allows us to nurture this sort of mindset that we ought to have as Muslims. Our mindset, our perspective is different from that of everybody else. And it should be different. And it is that difference in the mindset, in the mental attitude that we have, that will also lead to a difference in our behavior and in our actions and in our deeds. Now, the other meaning of taqwa that I would like to share with you, in some translations of the Qur'an, I believe in Yusuf Ali's translation, for example, he translated this particular statement in verse 183 of Surah Al-Baqarah, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ as, so that you may learn self-restraint. That is, you may learn to control yourselves. But control of oneself is really dependent upon consciousness of Allah. Because if you have the consciousness, you will be able to control yourself. It is when we lose that consciousness that we lose that ability to control. So that you may learn self-control. Now brothers and sisters, this is an interesting translation. Because it touches on a, on a particular issue about fasting. All of us know that when we fast, we have to, we're obliged to abstain from food and drink. The question is, why? Why is it we abstain from food and drink? Why can we not develop taqwa by other means? By no means, brothers and sisters, is fasting the only way we can develop taqwa. Yet in fasting, we're obliged to avoid eating and drinking. Why? Has to be some reason. Now all of us know that when you don't eat and drink, it's hard. It's hard on you physically. You become hungry, you become thirsty. In fact, this is the one thing that scares a lot of people. Most non-Muslims cannot figure how is it that the Muslims fast and not drink anything, not even water. 
They may understand how you can avoid food, but they're thinking water, no water, you will die if you do this. So why? Let me say first of all, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear in Surah Al-Baqarah as well, in talking about fasting, that the objective of the institution of fasting and its related laws and ahkam are not intended to place unnecessary hardships upon the individual. They are not intended to put our health at risk or our lives in danger. Far from overburdening us unnecessarily, Allah says that's not the objective at all. So we must be clear on this. For those who think that fasting is hard, physically hard, and they may think, you know, why is it we have to do this? They need to understand that this is not God placing unnecessary hardships on us. Allah says in this ayah in verse 185, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ a very beautiful way of dealing with this issue of whether the objective of the prohibition of abstaining or prohibition of eating and drinking what exactly is its objective Allah says first of all Allah wants ease for you in just in case anyone thinks well maybe Allah wants ease in most things Allah says وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ and he does not want difficulty for you. These are the two ways that Allah has made it clear. The ahkam of siyam in, in particular, the prohibition of eating and drinking, was intended not to place unnecessary hardships on anyone, that God never intended this and doesn't want this. Allah says he wants ease for you and he does not want hardships for you. So why then prohibit eating and drinking? Well, this is important in order to learn self-control. You see, brothers and sisters, the thing that fuels the physical desires and passions in a human being is food and drink. It's food and drink. Now, in order to help us to learn control of our desires, and by the way, if you go with this translation for this verse, about the objective of fasting, that it is so that you may learn self-control. Self-control does not only mean avoiding sinful things. That's certainly one aspect of self-control, and it's a major one. But self-control also has to do with controlling the urges that a person may have in indulging in what is mubah already. This is more difficult to avoid. Because we also hate it's mubah, it's allowed. What's the big deal? It's not wrong. The things that are wrong might be easier for us to control and avoid. But the things that are mubah might be more difficult to control. But it is important that we learn control of ourselves, brothers and sisters, in particular as it relates to the things that are mubah. Because as Imam al Nawawi rahimahullah mentions in his explanation of Sahih Muslim in, in commenting on a hadith. He said that overindulgence in the mubah is disliked. It is not encouraged. It's not haram, but overindulgence, one should be careful with overindulging in that which is mubah. Why? He said, first of all, it could lead to someone becoming distracted from the fara'id. You're just busy with the mubahat and you're forgetting the wajibat. Two, it could make the heart heedless or forgetful about the wajibat. So engrossed the person is in the mubahat. Three, he said, the mubahat or overindulgence in the mubahat could even take a person uh, closer to that which is haram. That which is haram. So although in a general way, and the fourth thing he mentioned about it is that he said, Overindulgence in the mubah would eventually lead to a hardening of the heart. Because remember, a person is now accustomed to indulging, although the things are permissible. But the thing is, the person becomes uh, accustomed to indulging in things. There's no control. 
no self-control. There is no division of needs versus wants or desires. In whatever we need, there is nothing wrong with that. The problem is, is the things that we want. Often the lines between needs and wants are blurred. So the wants are considered needs. And that's why you find many people, they're always in need. Everything for them is a need. And their whole lives are spent in pursuit of what they think are needs, while in reality most of it are just wants. You can live comfortably and happily without these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to think with clear minds to be able to differentiate between the needs and the wants. So he imposed fasting upon us to learn this. But to teach us to control our urges and desires, Allah has ordered that we, 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 we abstain from food and drink so that our physical passions and desires are weakened. And when they're weakened, you have a better chance of controlling them. So that over the period of 29 or 30 days, an individual learns that he or she can actually control these urges and desires. Now before I close, let me just share with you one quick example of what I mean when I talk about or when I say that depriving the body of food and drink helps to weaken our physical desires. I am sure at some point in your life, brothers and sisters, you must have experienced extreme thirst and hunger. I want you to think back. When you're very hungry, what do you think about? When you're very thirsty, what do you think about? I can assure you there's only one thing on your mind, nothing else. If you're very hungry, food is the only thing on your mind. If you're really thirsty, drink is the only thing on your mind. After you have eaten, you're satisfied, you might now sit down and think about the world of things. But at the time, there was only one thing on your mind. This is how it helps. That when we fast, we become hungry. And we should. If you tell me by 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the night, although the sun is still up, you're not hungry at all, then it means maybe you're hiding and eating and drinking. It's normal. We don't eat, we become hungry. This is natural and normal. I mean, simple math as we say. But that is precisely the objective. Because when the body becomes weak, these desires are no longer in the forefront. So it allows the individual now, not just to focus on the hunger, but now to focus or to be able to focus on other things. That's how it works. This is why we don't eat and we don't drink. Because if we were to continue to eat and drink while fasting, the desires will still be strong and we will find it very difficult to, to learn self-control. So we might, be, we might as well be fighting, as we say, a losing battle. After 30 days, we have lost the battle. We have learned that we can control our urges and desires. So Allah has actually, not just leveled the playing field, as we say, He's given us an advantage. You know, when you want to train someone, you don't give them the most difficult tasks at the beginning. Because if the person is convinced, I can't do this, they will never do it. What you do is, you start with simpler, easy things. You show them how they can progress and get to the more difficult things. So it is sort of a boost of the self-worth and self-esteem and morale of the person. So when the desires are weakened, we have greater control. So we learn that we can actually control them. And so by the end of the month, we have learned this lesson that I can control my urges. I can walk by the store and see things that I may want and be able to say, look, I don't need it and walk away. Now that I see something and I run in and I have to get it on the spot. And don't let all these sales signs fool you, brothers and sisters. All right, you need one thing, it tells you, but if you buy three, you get it at this price. At the end of the day, you're still paying more money for the three that you may not need. You may need to just one. So don't let the sales signs fool you into buying more. That's their objective. All these advertisements is to get us to part with our, our money. And that's why the advertisements always tell us that you need this, get it. Have you ever seen an advertisement that tells you you don't need this, don't get it? You haven't seen one like that. 
Because this is, this doesn't make any business sense, period. If you want people not to do something, that's when you tell them don't do it. But if you want them to get it, you encourage them. You make it appear as if they need this. Not just want it, they need it. It's a must have in life. And now the person, you know, spends their waking hours thinking, how can I get this? That is their objective. We need to control that. And how do we do that? One of the ways is, as Allah says in this ayah, is He imposed fasting upon us so we can learn these various techniques and ways of controlling the urges and desires we have. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up our hearts and minds and keep us uh, firm on the straight path. May He open our hearts and minds so that we can understand this message He has revealed for all of us, for all of mankind. And may He inspire us to live by this message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us firm on the straight path and may He forgive for us our mistakes and shortcomings. Inshallah, in the coming weeks and sessions, we'll talk about various other issues relating to fasting and questions that have come up from time to time so that once Ramadan begins, hopefully, we'll be better informed so that we can make better use out of this really wonderful time, brothers and sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته